Hatred or greed, paradise is the place we need. I feel the peace, feel the peace inside, of me. inside of me. Greetings and peace. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown welcoming you back to another episode of Interfaith Issues where we discuss the issues of common interest to the three monotheistic Abrahamic faiths of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Uh, I am going to be discussing today something that is a very big change from what I have done in the past. Something I think you will find more fun, more enjoyable, and I hope that it will be mind-broadening. What I'm going to be discussing is my latest book, the Eighth Scroll. This is the book, and I have recently completed a series of radio interviews in America in which one of the very first questions I was asked regarding this book was a question I think a lot of people are interested to hear the answer to, and that is simply why I wrote this book. The reason I wrote The Eighth Scroll is because, in simple terms, it was simply a slam dunk of an action-adventure novel. I think I am like many people. All of my life, I have been reading action-adventure novels, and I've been thinking, how did this author get the idea for that plot and bring it all together? And I've always been looking for something that I felt I could write about in the same way. Well, I found it. I found it in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. The Eighth Scroll captures these two very dynamic, very interesting, extremely controversial issues. The issues of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. The book starts by transporting the reader from ancient times to modern times, leading them from the Western society with which most familiar to the Middle Eastern society and the setting of the Holy Land. At the same time that it is transporting the reader, not only through time, but across the globe, it is transporting the reader through different ideologies. You will find representatives of different countries, different faiths, and the expression of their cultures and their beliefs. But most of all, what you will find is a very dynamic action-adventure that simply makes for fun reading. Now, let me start by giving a little bit of a taste for the content of the Eighth Scroll. I'll start by pointing out that the Dead Sea Scrolls for most people are a mystery. Most people don't understand what the excitement is about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, we found a bunch of old scrolls. They confirm books of the Old Testament. So what? Well, the important aspect of the Dead Sea Scrolls is that they were hidden away by a Jewish community believed to be the Essenes, but whoever it was does not really very much matter. What does matter is that the scrolls were hidden on or about the year 68 CE. Now that puts it about 30 years after the ministry of Jesus Christ. So the excitement about the Dead Sea Scrolls was the hope that they would tell us something about what was going on in Judea at that time. They were hidden away 30 years after the mission of Jesus Christ, so we were hoping that the Dead Sea Scrolls would shed some light on the early Jewish-slash-Christian community. For the most part, that hope was frustrated. For the most part, the Dead Sea Scrolls did not shed much light. However, the Dead Sea Scrolls do speak of a teacher of righteousness, who was opposed by a wicked priest, also known as the man of the lie, the man of scoffing, the man or the priest who made things easy. 
In other words, a priest who took the restrictions of Old Testament law and made things easy. And what could be more easy than negating the laws? Interestingly enough, this is exactly what we find in the Bible. In the New Testament, we find, in the book of Matthew, we find Jesus Christ having said, do not think that I have come to change the law, I have not come but to fulfill. Well, Paul then took a very opposite stance. Paul basically denied the law. We find in present day that more Christians are following Paul than they are following the teachings of Rabbi Jesus, an Old Testament Jew who taught and followed himself Old Testament law. The point being that there is very good evidence to suggest that the wicked priest, the priest who made things easy, referenced in the Dead Sea Scrolls, could be Paul. And the teacher of righteousness might be Jesus. So whether the teacher of righteousness was Jesus, James, or another of his disciples, somebody carrying on his teachings of righteousness, whether or not Paul was the wicked priest mentioned in the Dead Sea Scrolls, this is a very dynamic issue. But we have to consider some of the light that scholars have shed on, on this issue. The Dead Sea Scrolls Deception by Michael Bajant and Richard Lay states the following, quote, Paul is in effect the first Christian heretic <laughs> Strong words. Paul is in effect the first Christian heretic, and his teachings, which became or which become the foundation of later Christianity, are a flagrant deviation from the original or pure form extolled by the leadership. That is the book, The Dead Sea Scrolls Deception, their comment on this very issue. It has been pointed out that other scholars in the field believe that the Damascus document, one of the Dead Sea Scrolls, appears to document the excommunication of Paul from the early Christian community. Now, this is not a big surprise to scholars in the field who recognize the animosity between Paul and James, between Paul and Peter, between Paul and Barnabas. It is well documented in the New Testament that the disciples were in opposition to Paul. Read James. We find James condemning Paul in the strongest of terms in the language of that time and telling him to repent, which he does not completely succeed at doing. So these are huge controversies, but what we find is we find that this controversy, it threatens our lives, it threatens our religions, it threatens our salvation. So this, this is something to take seriously. Let me read you a quote from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Quote, This concerns those who were unfaithful together with the liar, in that they did not listen to the word received by the teacher of righteousness from the mouth of God. The Damascus document, one of the Dead Sea Scrolls, reveals that the teacher of righteousness claimed to be the one through whom God would convey, quote, the hidden things in which Israel had gone astray. Was this not Jesus' declared purpose, his reason for being? Was it not Jesus Christ who stated, quote, he was not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel? And we find in the Dead Sea Scrolls saying in very similar language that the teacher of righteousness would convey the word of God, conveying, quote, the hidden things in which Israel had gone astray.
So, the Eighth Scroll places the reader smack dab in the middle of this controversy. At the same time, because the setting is the Holy Land, smack dab in the middle of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And yet, it does it in the context of a fun read, an action adventure. Why? Let's face it. A lot of books have been written on this subject. A lot of scholarly books. A lot of dry, extremely scholarly, put you to sleep kind of books. I didn't want to write that. I wanted to write a dynamic book that people would read for the fun, for the thrill, for the action, for the adventure of the book. Let me put you in the scene of the time, in the time of 68 CE. According to our Bibles, John the Baptist was imprisoned and beheaded around 34 CE. Following this, Jesus Christ started his ministry, which lasted for three years. Upon the conclusion of his ministry, the Romans hunted down his disciples and killed them. Those who were not killed, those who were able to escape, disappeared from the historical record. And I am just getting into a hint of how interesting this gets. But it's time to take a break. Stick with us. We'll be back in just a few minutes. I feel the peace, I feel the peace inside of me. I feel the peace, I feel the peace inside of me. Welcome back. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown. We're discussing in this issue the Dead Sea Scrolls, my book upon the subject, the Eighth Scroll, which can be found on Amazon.com and on my website. No surprise to anybody. 8thscroll.com. I was starting to lay down some of the history to describe the setting of the book, and I will continue. The main voice that came out of this period was not the voice of one of the disciples, but rather the voice of one of the hunters. Paul, also known as Saul of Tarsus, but better known as the quote, Apostle Paul, was a Pharisee. He was a member of the Jewish priestly class that Jesus Christ condemned. And yet, he was the main voice to have risen during this period as an expression of his view of Christianity. On the basis of Paul's alleged vision and alleged conversion, he set about conveying his view of Jesus' teachings. Nonetheless, the Romans eventually caught up with Paul, imprisoned him around 61 CE. Notice we're getting closer to 68 CE, which is when the story of the Eighth Scroll starts. We presume that the Romans executed him. This has never been proven, but that is the story most commonly told. Now. None of this history makes the year 68 any more interesting than the year 60 or the year 55. But what does make 68 interesting was Nero's death. Nero was the fifth and last Roman emperor in the Julio-Claudian dynasty. He had spent 14 years establishing for himself the most notorious record of any Roman emperor. He had committed a list of notorieties that shamed him in front of the world and concluded with him becoming mad, becoming insane. Now, we should not be too surprised that this happened with Nero. We should not be too surprised that he was such a horrific person. If we look at his lineage, his mother was the sister of Caligula. Not only that, but she had unusually close ties with her brother, Caligula. Everybody knows how horrific Caligula was. Many people know that it was a common practice during the Roman Empire 
for the emperors and their sisters to know each other, how can I say it, extremely well. Incest among the emperors was not uncommon. It was considered a preservation of the pure blood of the aristocracy. There's every reason to suspect that Nero was the product of incest, that his father was Caligula, also known for the horrific character he was. So it should not surprise us that Nero himself became a horrific character. His mother, Agrippina, had some ambitions of her own, but Nero defended his throne to the point where he killed off every possible descendant, including his mother, including his adoptive brother. When his mother knew that her assassin was killing her on the orders of her son, she told her assassin to stab her where? In her womb, in her womb, as punishment for that womb having borne her wicked son Nero. So you can see how, how the emotions were boiling during this period, even within his own family. Legion's transgressions were legion. His excesses were extraordinary. His transgressions and his perversity, horrific. But what we need to remember for the Eighth Scroll as background is the accusation that Nero started the Great Fire of Rome in 64. After the Great Fire of Rome, he set about rebuilding Rome as a center of art. He considered himself an artisan. He wanted Rome to be a showplace of art. This was no inexpensive project, and he exhausted, he exhausted the treasury and started looking for money wherever he could find it. One of the places he could find it was the treasury of the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. And he sent orders to his representative in Jerusalem to take from the treasure in the temple. Well, the Jews had been under Roman rule. They had been oppressed, they had been terrorized, but taking from the treasure of, of their temple was the final straw. In 66, the Jews revolted and they started the Jewish rebellion against Roman rule. The Jewish rebellion lasted from 66 until 70 when the Jewish temple was destroyed and Jerusalem was taken over by the Romans. And it even continued after that until the year 73, which is when the infamous Battle of Masada occurred. For most historians, they place the battle from 66 to 70. Now we're right in the period of 68, when the story starts. What happened in this period was that Nero sent Vespasian, a battle-hardened general, to sweep through the Holy Land and subjugate it. And that's exactly what he did. Every town he came upon, he demanded their submission to the Roman Empire. And if they did not submit, he destroyed them utterly, killed the men, raped and subjugated the women, imprisoned them along with their children, and sold them as slaves, cut down all of the fruit-bearing trees, burned the village and the crops, and sowed salt into the fields so that they could not bear a crop again. Utterly destroyed. Utterly destroyed any population who would not submit. And one of the populations that was destroyed were the keepers of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, we can only speculate as to what happened in this time, but it appears that at least some of the scrolls were hidden away in the caves close to the area in which this Jewish community lived. And it is those scrolls that were preserved until their discovery in 1947 as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, there's a great deal more drama. There's a great deal more uh, dynamics to the story. And as you get into it, you will understand it as you go. But that is the basic background setting. So 68 was a very interesting year. On one hand, you had the Roman Empire trying to gain money for its treasury. 
On the other hand, you have the same Roman Empire thrown into turmoil. Because one thing I didn't mention is that after Nero set this ball into motion, he became insane, he was thrown out, and he lost his position as emperor and committed suicide. This threw the Roman Empire into upheaval. Over the next year, four different emperors tried to sit the throne, and only one was able to hold it, and that was the returning Vespasian, victorious from his battles in the Holy Land. But at the same time that the Roman Empire was in upheaval, searching for an emperor, searching for guidance within their own empire, the Jews were in rebellion not only against the Romans, but against one another. You had different groups among the Jews, you had extremists, you had the Sadducees, you had the Pharisees. You had even some professional assassins, which were kind of the ninjas of the Jewish world. And these actions were working against one another, trying to develop a supremacy within the Jewish population. Jerusalem, when it was assaulted in the year 70, was fully prepared to carry out the longest siege in history. It had water supplies in the form of wells. It had huge food stores. It was a walled enclave which could have held out for who knows how long. But in order to force the population to battle, the extremists among them set fire to the food stores. Once the food stores were gone, by the force of starvation, the Jews of Jerusalem were forced to take, to take the battle outside the walls of Jerusalem to the Romans, and this precipitated the fall of Jerusalem. In the middle of all of this, we have the keepers of the scrolls fighting for their own survival and fighting for the preservation of the message that they held as holy in the form of the scrolls that they were charged to preserve. And it is the story of the preservation of those scrolls, the bringing of those scrolls to light, and most particularly of one scroll, a fictional scroll whose content was so controversial that when found, it could not be revealed. And that is the setting of the eighth scroll. Now, I hope to come back in another episode and give you a taste of the book in the form of a reading. But we'll have to save that for next time. For now, this is Dr. Lawrence Brown concluding another episode of Interfaith Issues. Until next time, peace. Where are we going in this world of woe? So much suffering and misery. Our hearts are longing for the endless Home of peace and love and harmony. Oh, no more bitterness, hatred or greed. I feel the peace inside of me. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown with another episode of Interfaith Issues. I concluded last session discussing this book, The Eighth Scroll, uh, a book that I have authored. It can be found on Amazon.com. It can be found on the website, www.eighthscroll.com. And I would like to continue with this episode by doing something which I think is a little bit unusual, but it takes me back to my childhood. You have to remember I'm 50 years old. When I was raised, we still had radio shows where they read dramas and they played out a drama to the audience in a reading. And that is what I would like to do to you or do for you <laughs> inflict upon you, some might say, in this episode. I'll begin by reading the back cover of the book, 
to give the audience a flavor. Those who saw the episode before, I described how The Eighth Scroll is an action-adventure novel. It is a novel that throws the audience into two very dynamic controversies. One is the controversy of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The other is the controversy of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. The back cover reads as follows. An ancient scroll has been unearthed. 1,900 years after the Essene Jews hid their most precious scrolls in the caves at Qumran, a Catholic priest working on the Dead Sea Scrolls project discovers a text that describes the final edict of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but hides it in fear of the heresy it contains. When prominent archaeologist Frank Tones unearths a reference to the hidden scroll, he wonders if this scroll could be the long-lost gospel of Jesus, or maybe even of James. But before he can act, those who know of the scroll's existence become mysteriously silent or dead, leaving only a father and son team to find the scroll and tell its secrets to the world. In an epic, multi-generational story that spans the globe, they must outwit the Mossad, the CIA, and the Vatican's secret weapon, the Mafia, the Italian Mafia, to bring the truth to light, no matter the cost. Let me begin. Let me give you a reading. I would like everybody in the audience, as I did when I was a child, to sit back and relax, maybe even close your eyes, listen to the story and get a taste so that you understand where the story will take you and whether or not you would like to continue it on your own. Prologue. Qumran. On the Dead Sea. 68 CE. Qumran, I must say, is the area where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. 68 CE was the time when the keepers of the Dead Sea Scrolls, presumably the Essene Jews, were wiped out. That is the time when the Dead Sea Scrolls were hidden. And this is how the story begins. When death approaches, your life will play before your eyes. The elder who told Jacob this years before now lay crumpled in a bloody heap before him nestled in ringlets of his own intestines and oozing the stink of disembowelment. Jacob tore his gaze from the twitching corpse, locked eyes with the Roman legionnaire who lifted his weapon from the lifeless body, and froze when the legionnaire raised his gore-streaked sword for the stroke that would sever Jacob's neck. As though with a mind already detached, as though time in itself paused to honor him with one last memory, Jacob recalled not his whole life, but only the last hour. He had been hunched over in the bowl of his cave, working frantically to hide the Essenes' library of scrolls. One glance out the mouth of the cave at the darkening sky, mirrored in the vast expanse of the Dead Sea below, told him he had run out of time. Why did I ever join the sect of Essene Jews? If they knew my Christian beliefs, they would banish me forever. The instant he conceived the thought, his mind conjured up memories. Memories of slashing swords, screams, and bodies tumbling into the dust in pieces. That's why I joined, he said to himself, for protection. For a moment he reflected how, 30 years ago, the Romans had hunted down the disciples of Jesus, the Christ. Now, two years into the Jewish rebellion, the Romans hunted down all Jews, excepting his own sect of Essene Jews. But every Essene knew their scant protection could end at any instant, and Jacob couldn't banish from his fears the tales of wild beasts tearing Christians to pieces in the Roman Colosseum, which Emperor Nero 
had kept lit at night with human candles. Martyrs, he muttered, but found little consolation in the fact. Jacob snatched up the most precious of all the scrolls. The parchment whispered against his fingers as he swiftly rolled it. Despite his reverence for the scripture, his hands shook, and he splattered hot wax as he dripped it from his candle to seal the free edge of the scroll. He forced himself to draw deep breaths of the musty cave air until his hands steadied, and then stamped the puddles of fast cooling wax with the Roman captain's signet ring. Then he applied a linen wrap and sealed the free edge of the wrap as well. He shoved the scroll into an exquisite limestone jar, but then froze. Gently, he placed the jar on the floor of the cave, grabbed handfuls of his shoulder-length hair close to his scalp with both hands and rocked himself until he felt his nerves still. Calm down, he told himself, just calm down. Slower now, Jacob removed the scroll from the jar, checked it for damage, and gently slid it back into the jar. Then he fitted the lid with a sandy rasp, picked up his sputtering candle, and poured a ribbon of molten wax into the seam. After he sealed the jar closed, but before the wax had a chance to cool, his Essene brothers arrived. Jacob jumped up and wrestled three earthenware jars, each half the height of a man and filled with scrolls to the cave entrance. He stumbled in his haste and nearly dropped one jar. The rough pottery slipped in his fingers, but he caught it in time. It bumped the floor of the cave, but didn't break. The brothers heaved the jars into their arms, cast Jacob a worried glance, and then hurried off to hide the jars in distant caves. Jacob returned to the cubit-long limestone jar sized for a single scroll and applied the captain's ring to the cooling wax around the lid. Why had the captain ordered him to hide the scrolls? Jacob had heard the rumors, of course. Roman legionnaires with Jewish sensitivities, or Christian Jewish in everything but name, Romans who tormented the followers of Jesus the Christ by day, and then prayed for forgiveness to the God Jesus had spoken of at night. He had heard such men existed, but had never met one, until the captain of the legionnaires. Jacob buried the limestone jar in the mountain of parchment sheets stacked in the center of the cavern. He said a quick prayer, sweat streaming from beneath his arms as he raised his quivering hands to the heavens and then bolted from the cave. The barren Judean desert seemed drawn closer to the heavens by the crimson ceiling of sunset, but Jacob had no time to enjoy the view. With practiced speed, he picked his way across the ridge of land that led to the complex, passing groups of legionnaires as they lounged on the terrace, their weapons ever near at hand. He feigned calm when he visited the captain in his quarters, but once he had returned the captain's signet ring, he rushed toward the dining hall's welcoming glow and the voices of his milling brethren, his fears flailing about in his mind. By the doorway and to the right, the captain had instructed. Why? Jacob wondered. Even as he entered the dining hall and sat as bidden, that why haunted him during the conversation and dinner that followed. Midway through the meal and fighting the quivering weakness in his legs, he made to stand when the doorway filled with the bulk of, of a Roman legionnaire, his sword naked in his hand. Like shadows in an unfocused nightmare, Jacob could barely make out the mass of forms behind the soldier. He cast a glance at the only other exit. 
it too was filled with a clot of legionnaires. He scanned the room to find his brothers frozen, their food and drink suspended midway to their mouths. The Roman captain shouldered his way into the chamber and shouted, Stay sitting! The words caught a few brothers as they rose, and they lowered back to their seats while the captain repeated his command, this time more gently, as if to reassure a child. A child about to be slaughtered. Jacob realized. The captain let his eyes rest on Jacob a split second longer than on the others. Then he said, I have been ordered to kill anyone who refuses to swear loyalty to the Roman Empire. So that's it, Jacob thought. That's why the captain wanted the scrolls hidden. Until now, the captain continued. Your protector, Agrippa II, has never demanded an oath of allegiance. That has changed. With the rebellion of your people, an oath is demanded. And now, it's time for a break. So, we'll be back in just a few minutes. I feel the peace. Welcome back. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown, continuing with this episode of Interfaith Issues. In this episode, I am reading from my novel, The Eighth Scroll, and I will continue from where I left off. The Roman legionnaire captain is stating as follows. Until now, your protector, Agrippa II, has never demanded an oath of allegiance. That has changed. With the rebellion of your people, an oath is demanded. Our hands are empty, and you know it one of the Essenes said. We have no weapons. How are we a threat to you? My orders are absolute, the captain replied. You swear allegiance or die. Who is first? One of the brethren stood and strode toward the captain, a short, squat man of timid demeanor. Jacob knew this man only but slightly. The lead soldier stepped between the two and met the Essene's chest with the tip of his sword. Unshaken, the Essene said, We swear devotion to one, and to one alone, and then looked past the soldier and locked eyes with the captain. And the one to whom we swear devotion is the one who made us, and the one who made you, and the one to whom we shall all return. Another step closer, and the Essene forced the soldier to retract his arm into a fully cocked position, resting its tip against the brother's chest. The same one who will judge all of us, he said, and assign righteous to paradise and the sinful to hellfire. To this one, to the Almighty, we swear allegiance and to him alone. For a moment, Jacob felt the brother's words fill the chamber and bolster the faith of the believers. But then the soldier drove the sword home. The blade exploded a foot out the man's back. The soldier gave the sword a savage quarter turn, then wrenched it back with a sucking sound and a gush of blood. The squat man, bent forward by the blow, abruptly straightened and turned around to face his brothers. Triumph on his face, he pointed to the heavens with a smile. The second thrust drove the sword in the man's back and out the front. He staggered forward and looked down and blinked as he watched the blade retract through his chest. Then he dropped to his knees, coughed up a great gout of blood, fell sideways into the lap of a brother and died, a smile full on his bloodied lips. The captain stepped to the side and Jacob watched as soldiers surged from the darkened doorway like emissaries from hell. The air filled with shouts of testimony from the faithful 
grunts and curses from the soldiers, and the wet chunking sound of meat met by metal. Swords swept in great arcs, blades plunged into bodies, and battle axes cleaved the air and buried their blades in flesh and bone. An occasional groan escaped the dying, but never a scream or a sob, and not one oath of allegiance to the Romans. Jacob found himself on his hands and knees, sheltered between the wall and the legs of the captain. The soldiers were crazed, the chamber poorly lit, and the legionnaires flowed through the doorway, straight past him, with nary a glance backward. Jacob's favored elder fell to his knees nearly in front of him, groaning incoherently as he scrabbled to scoop up the guts that spilled from his slit open belly. The Roman who stood over the elder beheaded him with a swipe of his sword, kicked the corpse to the floor, and then knelt beside it and hacked at the headless torso. Horrified, Jacob nestled closer to the wall. The legionnaire pulled his sword from the elder's body, turned and latched eyes with Jacob. Standing, he lifted his blood-streaked sword and stepped into striking range. When death approaches, your life will play before your eyes. Jacob's mind snapped back when the captain whirled, jerked Jacob to his feet, and pinned him against the cold stone wall, waving the soldier away. To Jacob, the captain whispered harshly. Jacob jerked his eyes back to the captain's face, a grim, taut mask, with eyes that betrayed only the barest twinkle. He gasped a breath in two quick stutters and yelled, I swear allegiance. I swear allegiance. Soldiers turned from their kills and snickered, unaware of the props behind the play. The closest legionnaire lowered his sword, spat into the dirt floor, and turned away in disgust. This one bears true allegiance, the captain yelled to them. Let no one harm him, for he is under my protection. He turned back to Jacob and whispered, Peace be with you, my friend. Pray for me. Then he swung Jacob around like a puppet and shoved him through the doorway, straight into the arms of a waiting legionnaire. And at that moment, Jacob knew death. The certainty of it cast a blanket of calm over him, and he closed his eyes in prayer. Hey, enough of that, the legionnaire said with a grim chuckle. Look where that got your friends. Jacob froze, disbelieving. But the legionnaire grabbed his arm and led him out of the complex. At first, his legs faltered, but the legionnaire steadied him, as though guiding a man feeble with fever. At the outer wall, the Roman belted something about his waist and whispered, food and currency. Jacob's fear-weakened legs nearly buckled when the legionnaire draped a full water skin over his shoulders, but he straightened immediately when he felt a ring slipped onto his finger. Captain changed his mind, the soldier said. He said, you'll be needing this more than he. Now listen carefully. If anyone stops you, show him the ring. That will guarantee you safe passage. Next, use your water sparingly. It must last you until you find safety. You can't go to Jerusalem. That would be suicide. So take the trade route opposite. And stay away from here until this is over. And Jacob, and Jacob, may God be with you. Jacob swallowed hard with a throat sucked dry by fear. So it was true. There were friends, albeit the most hypocritical kind, in the ranks of the Romans. But there was no time for talk, and the legionnaire gave him a push start backward into the darkness and drew his sword. Jacob stood numbly and watched, helpless as a lamb before the slaughter, but the soldier only winked and disappeared back into the complex. 
For a moment, Jacob stood rooted to the spot, but then the demons of his fears spun him around and chased him into the night. This is only the beginning of the Eighth Scroll. From here, the book transports the audience into modern day. As I said before, this book will take the audience from their lounge chairs in America to a lounge chair in England, where the story continues. From there, on to the Holy Land. It will transport the reader around the world and through time. It will transport the reader into the heart of the controversies over the Dead Sea Scrolls, over the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, and over the differences between the Jewish, Christian, and Islamic religions. But more than anything else, it will take the reader's imagination on a ride, on an adventure, through all of this, and inshallah, give them a story they will never forget. So, I conclude this, this episode of Interfaith Issues by thanking you. Once again, this is Dr. Lawrence Brown, your host of this episode, and asking all those who wish to read further, please go to my website, eighthscroll.com, E-I-G-H-T-H, scroll, S-C-R-O-L-L dot com, or my second website, leveltruth.com, L-E-V-E-L-T-R-U-T-H dot com. For now, and until the next episode, peace. Where are we going in this world of woe? So much suffering and misery. Our hearts are longing for the endless home of peace and love and heart.